Hello and welcome to Four Burners. My name is Josh L. And joining me this week, very special guest. I say that about all my guests, but they're all very special. Please welcome into your hearts, into your ears. It's comedian, podcaster, TV host. It's, it's Claire Hooper, everyone. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I. I'm a big fan of the pod. You're the first person who's actually come in, not come in, but when you were when we were kind of discussing this, going, I'm I'm really nervous about it. Like nobody else is. Nobody. Well, no one's told me they have been. There's been a few people at the end of them that was that was made me have a little internal crisis. But I, I don't know why. It's it's a fun chat. It doesn't have to it's be because deep. I began my crisis early. I've been carrying a crisis around for twelve months, so yeah, I just right. know. That. Well, I, I asked you. Uh, no, I didn't. I told you what the show was before, like about three or four months before I actually started it. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, that is. I want to listen to it. Like I. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I have been listening to it. Yeah. So well, maybe I've overconsumed the pod, and that's why I've overthought it a little bit. No, nah, please don't say that. Don't no, no, you can't overconsume. Just yeah, listen right. to them all. There is no back such back. thing. Listen to listen to them more than once. Yeah. Why not? I need the numbers. I really, I really didn't know. Um, so it's up to you. Wherever you want to start, you want to start career, health, family, friends, whatever you want to do, and we'll we'll, we'll, do, we'll do it easy. It's, it's all good. I really appreciate that. I feel like more than maybe even more than ever before in my life, the four are interconnected in a real, like it's a it's a sticky web. Yep. And so it's, and I think that's partly why I'm nervous because, because I'm afraid of going all over the place. But yep. I'm also, I feel like, I feel like we are always two truths at once. We're our public face and that is true yeah. and real and then there is stuff that isn't useful to air. Yeah. And if other people know those things, then it actually makes it a lot harder to do the public face. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I So I got stuck in my career of being the really nice kind of gentle librarian cake boy. Yes. And it kind of wasn't true. I mean, I'm, I'm, I think I'm a nice person. Yeah, I know you're a nice person. But I'm also, I've got a, a, a darker side that I'm like, like most comics do, where I'm like, it's it's not evil, but it's that thing of like, I I find stuff funny that I probably shouldn't because I, I know how comedy works. Yeah. You understand? Like, <laughs> Yes, I understand. Where I, I watch stuff and I'm like, that's funny because I, I know why it's funny, even though I don't agree with what the person's saying. I think we've had this discussion about Eddie Murphy's Raw. Like mm. you can go look at that and if you wrote it down, you go, this is disgusting, this shouldn't be said on stage, but then you watch it and you're like going, in terms of stand-up comedy and a comedian, I get. In terms of structure and yep. the appropriate delivery of the bit yep. and in terms of it being uh, in terms of it being something that is of its time. Like yeah. if you think about the lack of enlightenment around those topics at the time, then there's almost something great about how he is easing the pressure on a topic that nobody's yeah. dealing with properly already. So I'm not I'm not advocating no. for that comedy special. But if you look in a really analytical comedy way, you're like, I see the structure, I see the culture it came out of, I, I see the confident delivery being the right way to do it. Yeah. I didn't think we'd start there. But we I did. didn't think we'd start no, there either. That's all right. We're justifying Eddie Murphy. I, do we... I think he's fine. He doesn't need our, our help. Well, I mean, is, does this mean we should start on comedy then? Should do you want to start, start career? On career? Okay, let's start do, career. Is that awfully dull? I mean, this no, podcast, no, the inevitability of this podcast is you're going to get person after person who really values their career because because if you're in if you're in these industries, yeah. it really does take a lean in. Well, yes, to, to to actually if it's a if it's an industry in the public eye. Yeah. Well, we we. In the next coming weeks, we've got a few we're branching out outside of the comedy world, which I'm excited about. Just because. Oh, and you haven't been. You've had a sports person. You've had a writer. Like yeah. it's not like that. But I think it's true with sports people as well that unless you're really putting the time in to yeah. your career, it is actually hard to continue to do it yes. professionally. Yeah. All right, career. So, okay, career. So I, I. So what do you tell people you do? That's a really good question, and I have. I. Have gotten a lot better at saying comedian. Yep. And uh, I think it took a long time because there were a few just really <laughs> miserable experiences. Like I put it on my incoming passenger card once, you know, landing, and it was a 5 a.m. morning walk through the customs queue. Yeah. And so when they see that and they're like, all right, tell me a joke, and you're like, 
it's 5 a.m. Yeah. and I don't want to. So I started putting writer yeah. on my incoming passenger card. So I often say, writer, I feel like now I'm not, it's not like everybody recognises me, but enough people do yeah. that I kind of can't pretend to be something else. I just have to say TV host or comedian. It is that hard thing as well when people do recognise you and they say, well, what do you do? Because they're being polite. And if you say something not true, they're like, oh, that person. What a dick move. Yeah. And I, I've done that as well. I've done like, oh, I'm a writer. And then they're like, oh. I mean, you and I are writers. We, we, we do are write writers. We're write not lying, stuff. but we're also being like... Yeah. Um, revoltingly humble when we should just own what we do, I guess. Yeah. So I think we started around pretty much the same time. My first year at the Comedy Festival was also your first year at the Comedy Festival. Well, my first year was 2004 Raw. Oh, okay. Yeah. I did, yes, I did Raw Comedy. Yes. In 2004. I started, well, I did my first ever gig in 2003. Yep, me as well. Did you? Yep. What was so your, we what, really what was did. your first gig? It was in Perth, of yep. course. Mine was in Tassie. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember the gig? Yeah, I remember the gig. Um, lovely Xavier Michaelides. Yes. Yeah, well, lots of your listeners would know. I know. Yeah. I, um, I guess I sort of walked sideways into his friendships. Our friendship circles overlapped. I watched him support Tripod on a Perth comedy stage, com- Comedy Lounge. Yep. And um, raved to him about how amazing it was what he did. And he was like, it's not that hard. You could do it. <laughs> Which is just really nice yep. of him. And then, um, you know, just whenever we hung out, he would sort of point out anything I said. He's like, that could be a bit, that could be a bit. Yeah. And he arranged for me to do my first ever gig at the Comedy Lounge. And it was, I mean, it wasn't immaculate, but it was like a, Enough. oh, that's fun. Yeah. And nothing bad happened when the jokes didn't work. So before that, were you doing theatre? Yeah, I tried to study occupational therapy because it was one of those like, is is that the most creative of the academically strong career paths? Do you yeah. know, like I thought a, I thought a compromise would work. It didn't. I, and then I um, swapped over into humanities and I studied film and television and theatre. And, yeah. and then when I got out, I just did a little bit of everything because I was in Perth. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I think going into comedy, a lot of the people's biggest fear about doing it is just being on stage. Yeah, so I didn't have that. Yeah, which I think is why we have a lot of, in this industry, a lot of ex-teachers or ex-lawyers because they're so used to being in front of people and speaking. Yes, just really comfortable having yeah. a bunch of eyes on them. Yeah. And in the case of teachers, you got a lot of, like, disinterested eyes. And I did a lot of theatre and education where you go around to primary schools in these semi-rural areas of well, Western Australia and you teach kids about bullying yeah, I did or the, the history of Western Australia. Of course you yeah. did. And that is um, that is especially good for comedy because you really are getting, you're getting some really sullen faces yeah. in your audiences. Yeah, me and Harley Breen were doing one with Nellie Thomas. Nellie Thomas yes. wrote it. And, uh, yeah, we were, and it was great because you'd get on there and Harley was so great because he'd just swear in the first, like, minute and all the boys, oh! this is cool and so once he swears like and it's nothing bad just says shit or something like that but high school kids are like this is the best and then afterwards have teachers go how did you get them engaged for so long and Harley's like because I swore at them yeah that was easy (laughs) (laughs) Uh, so you do do your first gig obviously goes well enough that you go I want to do it again you go in raw yeah go in raw comedy I won the um WA yep raw comedy went to the town hall lost to Nick's son yes um, that who, was Nick Sun and Kent Valentine, I think, were the first, the winner and runner-up that year. I don't think Kent Valentine was the runner-up. Oh, he, okay. Not not my year. Oh, I know. I, I was I was living here and I remember the Sydney guys coming down and going, oh, they're, they're really good. I, I didn't do wrong. They were really good. Those Sydney guys were yeah. really good. You don't come from Perth and take it out of the hands of the Sydney guys. Mm. No way. Um, yeah, I did, did well enough to... Um, like the festival does kind of keep, if you turn up, do a good roar at the town hall, but you don't win, you're still on the radar. You yeah. still get a little bit of kindness from the festival. So then got in Comedy Zone the year after. Yep. And that's where we met. Yeah. That's yep. the year we met. Yeah. Because that was the year Tim Minchin um, kind of. Exploded. Yes. And being a Perth guy. We'd had a lot to do with each other. And yeah. so when he got um, that, he exploded that year at Melbourne Comedy Festival, the Gilded Balloon, one of the big Edinburgh venues, picked him up to yeah. do Edinburgh. And he was sus on the promises they were making. He was like, look, they're saying they're producing, but can you come over with me in August to Edinburgh 
and just kind of like cover the gaps that they're, you know, they're not going to do everything. Yeah. He got over there two or three days ahead of me and called me from Edinburgh and he was like, I know you got your ticket, but you don't have to come. Like he turned up and he's on, like his post is blown up. He's getting so much pre-promotion. Yeah. Like Gilded Balloon really got behind him. I did not have to do I basically just got a one-month holiday yep. in Edinburgh while I watched my mate skyrocket. And did you just watch a whole bunch of shows? Watched a whole bunch of shows, did line-up gigs, of course. Yep. Um, slept on a floor. Yeah. You know, like, so I, I'm pretty sure that most of my time I spent on the lounge room floor of Minchin's sister's Airbnb until I worked out that lying on the floor was dull. And then I just got like a bunk bed in a, yep. in a backpackers. It was, it was very, you know, like, yeah, wouldn't do it now. Great times in your late twenties. Exactly. So just going back a bit. So was it a surprise to your family that you chose comedy? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think my parents were used to being you know, like confused by my choices. Yeah. Uh, they were not um, They were not dismissive and they did not condemn them. Yeah. But I think I frequently chose to do things that they didn't understand the motivation behind. Yeah. And so when was Sideshow? Was that 2007? 2000? Yeah. So yeah. the Sideshow was 2007. I'd actually done little bits of... Uh, work on an on a Perth TV show. Yep. Nothing anyone would ever remember, and I don't think it broadcast outside of Perth with Sam Longley and yep. Jimmy James Eaton was on it. Yes. So there were yeah. So I'd had a little taste of TV, and um, I was just so. I was very fortunate. I was sort of right place, right time, right voice yep. to get picked up. I moved to Melbourne, got picked up really quickly by a management company. The management company put me in a meeting. With Ted Robinson yep. of Big good Gig News, and Good yep. News Week, and he was putting together this ABC show, yep. and I ended up doing it every single week that year. I only ask that because that is a thing that when people don't know anything about comedy, they're like, "Oh, I'm on TV," and they're like, "Oh, great, that's actually a job." So you wouldn't have had your parents stressing out, going, "That what is Claire going to do? Right? She's going down this. She was doing an occupational therapy degree. Now she's doing this." And if you're like ten years of just doing stand up, sometimes. Oh, I just know from my own experience, my parents knew I was doing fine, but just don't know how to like process it. How, yeah. How do they gauge whether or not you're doing okay? Yeah. And how much they have to be worried about you. Yeah. And then when you get on TV, your parents, friends see you on TV and they say, I saw Claire on TV. And I think that is the point where your parents go, maybe it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So did you, when you started, have any five-year plan, 10-year plan? Did you have like a vision board or anything like that? No, never. And I wish, uh, look, I I wish I did, but I I, I would like to be the sort of person who does a little bit of better, a bit better future planning. Yeah. But the, but (laughs) But you, if you say out loud you want something and then you don't get it, even if you get some other good thing, you still failed at the thing you said you wanted to get. And so I've got, I've got a little bit of prote- self-protection there, I think. Yeah. I think that's part of the instinct not yeah. to plan. Oh, well, in five years I'm going to have my own sitcom. Bow, bow. I'm so sorry. All you got to do was the gala every year. In a, I, I think our generation has a problem with saying what we actually want. Yep. I don't think younger comics suffer from that. No. I think it's actually rewarded. Oh, it sends me reeling. I'm I like, know. Well, what? You I think... just said you de- you wanted to do television? Yeah. You're meant to pretend you don't want to do television, then act surprised when you get television. But we're about the same age. And so looking at music, it was all like, oh, so if you sign to a major label, that's selling out. And you'd like, it's a whole thing of like, no, you don't. Even though Nirvana was the biggest band in the world, they were all like, yeah, we don't want to sell out. It's like, well, you... selling out just means you sell tickets. Like, that's, that's what it means. Like, it means you're doing it for a job yeah. instead of for a hobby. Yeah, but I think it's not ruined me, but it's that thing it, always in the back of my head going, I can't let people know I want this. That's that's lame. That's not cool. But, you know, you get over it. Oh, <laughs> we're back to that conversation about public face and, and yes. interior life, aren't we? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I have, I've never planned. Okay. So what, what about comedy do you think people don't understand? What do people not understand about comedy? About being a comedian. Um, uh, I think people, 
I guess the main thing is people don't understand how much hard work it is and how tired you are because because it doesn't work if they know the truth. Yeah. Because the whole game is act like you just wandered onto stage, found yourself there and all of these things are occurring to you in the minute and you couldn't be, you wouldn't want to be anywhere else right now when some days you really underslept, you've actually worked eight hours on the things you're pretending to just think of in the moment and you also are absolutely desperate to be home with your children who you haven't seen for a few nights. Yeah. So it's all... It's all pretend, but it is also, as I said, the other truth exists. Like in the moment, it is fun, and you are happy to be there. Yeah. Yes. Um, but I think, but I think maybe, if you're doing the job well, then you are, you are kind of keeping the truth from people that um, yeah. it's it's it, there is work. Yeah. There's your 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 duck legs are paddling pretty hard. How do you go putting on that brave face? When, you know, you don't want to be at the gig or you don't want to be doing the show that you've signed on for or whatever it is. How do you, do you go, okay, like, oh, I'm just going to do the do the job. This you is bet. what I'm paid for. You bet. I'm really good yeah. at it. I did theatre and education, Josh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I really, I don't mind. I don't mind um, thinking of the job like a service job. Yeah. And it's like, my job right now, it's, this is not about me and how I feel. This is about making this night successful so yeah. it's a, yeah like i don't i don't resent putting on a brave face yeah when have you have you quit jobs before yeah yeah like yeah so i have i tried very hard um to quit a radio job but wouldn't be wasn't let out of my contract so i did two years of breakfast radio and it's really good for some people and it wasn't good for me that was, was in sydney very right? very bad at it yeah it was in sydney yeah yeah and um yeah, I didn't. I didn't enjoy that environment, and I didn't really enjoy the. Um, um, I didn't. Re- I didn't enjoy the compromise. You know, like it's. Um, I don't mind. I don't mind staying at work later than you told me I'd have to do. I don't mind. Um, maybe. Uh, what am I? What am I trying to say? You know, like um, don't mind being an event. And they're like, actually, can you draw the raffle as well? Can you stay a bit later and draw the? Raffle? I'm like, yeah, I'm quite a flexible person. But when somebody's telling me what to th- pretend to think, yeah, I really bristle and there's a lot of that in radio yeah i think we're both very similar that like part of the joy of being a comedian is that you get paid to be yourself yeah so it's jarring when they're like we love you yeah we're gonna pay you to be you actually not you not quite that you can you just change it a little bit every single day um early in the morning when you're tired and grumpy please can you just pretend and had you did you know your co-host before like you no, I've met him yeah. before we went on air, but we weren't long time yeah. mates. And I really liked I have worked with two different co hosts and I have nothing bad to say about them. They were both yeah. lovely people who were really good supports for me yeah. in that environment. Uh, yeah, because I've worked in Breakfast Radio as well with people who I didn't really know beforehand and bit and they're both lovely people. But it's just that it's very hard to get that on air chemistry when you are really go- I don't actually know like Yeah, you don't you you're not used to dancing with them. Yeah. Good way to put it. All right. Um, if it wasn't for comedy, would there be another career you could see yourself very happy in? I don't know. Um, because um, because it's very easy to go, grass is greener. Yeah. And I... <clears throat> uh, I've, I have always thought and I've left it too late that I'd be a really good vet. And I feel like I wish I'd gone into that instead of occupational therapy and I might have stuck with it. It's not about loving animals. What it is is about like you need really good broad scientific knowledge in a specific field and then you need to be really good with people. I'm not the first person to say this, but vets compared to doctors, doctors specialise in you can be an eye doctor, that's all you look at. Vets, every fucking animal you've got to know. Okay, And every part of every animal. Yeah, Yeah. And and they won't tell you, is this painful? You've got to... Press on them and go. All yeah. right, yep, they bit me. That must be painful. But they, but half of the job. So half of the job is quite a huge amount of specialized knowledge, and then the other half is owners, and it's really dealing yeah. dealing with people, people in a in in a kind of like heightened version of themselves. And I feel like I'd I'd love that job, but it's too late now. I was backstage at a gig once, and I think I may have told this on a pod before, but uh, there's another comedian there. And he brought his mate and I asked him, oh, what do you do? And he goes, I'm a vet. 
I said, what's the worst animal you have to like deal with thinking, oh, it'll be like cats. I've got cats. I love cats. But it's like when they're at the vet, they're fucking, they're nightmares. And he said a guinea pig. Oh. Be- Why? Because he- he's like, they're five bucks. Just buy another one. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is. A it's very- hard to heal what you don't respect. Yeah, it's a very good answer when you're like, he's going, I know how much you're paying me an hour to do this. They're five bucks. Just, yeah. Anyway. That's amazing. <laughs> All right. Uh, so oh, this is the one question I And I normally ask this because people pick career last. But Oh, do, was I? Oh. No, no. I love the fact you picked it first because that's where everyone knows you as. That's so where it's, we were. It's, yeah. That's it's, where we were It's at. good. Okay. So I'm a magic genie. I grant you any wish to do with your career. What do you wish for? Shall I tell you the first thing I thought of? What's that? Oh, he is. I want the genie to make me content to stop. Ah, that's the good answer. So, because it is, look. How do you know when to stop? It's sad, isn't it? Because you think, oh, the audience will tell me. But no, there is that pool going just the next the next audience will probably be different to this one. But I don't know what I want to do. Like I'm not saying there's something else I want to do. Yeah. But I think um, after 20 years in the biz, there's something so groundhog day about just going, maybe this is the year Yeah. that it's 100%. And it's, and I think I might be talking like this because we're on the eve of the Melbourne International Comedy Festival, which yep. is a really strange time for a lot of a lot of comedians. Really love it, but it's definitely strange for all of us because it's our it's our Christmas. Yeah. And I'm finding myself about to do the same thing again, and I'm like, imagine if I imagine if I just didn't feel the pull. Yeah. And was quite happy to wave at the docks as the rest of you went on into the ocean. Have you had years off from doing festival? Yeah. How did that feel? Absolutely fine. Yep. I'm, I have every second year off and it's completely fine. And I am the same. After every single year, I say to Beck, I think that's it. I think I'm done. But she goes, well, you say this every year. And then about two months after, I'm like, I think I have an idea for a new show. Yeah. And it's the idea of the new show. It's not the yeah the pull of... I want the genie to stop me having an idea for yeah. a new show. <laughs> but, okay, but that is the t- this is the timing of when the question is posed. And I think, most, I think most days that was just the awful first answer that came to me. But that sort of talk is really deadly. And probably the truth is most of the year my answer would be, can the genie please let me have a writing team of all of my favourite comedian friends and we're working on a commissioned Australian sitcom and we all know it's a really good idea. Yeah. I mean that's the dream. That's yep. that's my dream. That's... I love um, collaborative work Yeah. and I love the idea of creating something. Do you have an idea for a sitcom? I do. Yeah. yeah, I do. And I've had it for ages and I just had another idea on the weekend where I'm like, I think that's the bit to bring to it that makes it worth sitting down and write. Yeah. yeah. A bit busy right now though. All right. Career. Thank you. All right. Friends, family, health. Which one do you want to do next? Let's talk family. Okay, great. What is it? <laughs> family. <laughs> F-A-M-A-O-Y till the day we die. Now, um, I don't think you've got siblings. Yeah, I've got two brothers. They live two, in Perth still. Two brothers. I, as I was coming here, I thought, and don't. This is not an insult. This, don't take this as any. It's like, grew up with boys. I don't know why. You just give off grew up with boys vibe. Oh yeah, but I was the oldest, so I didn't grow up. I didn't grow up as the little sister of big brothers. Yeah. I just grew up as the boss of two boys. Yeah. Okay. So, and what what do your parents do? They've got a garden centre. No, nice. I mean, like, to be honest, that's probably, I'm not, oh, it's too late for me to become a vet. I am a qualified garden designer and the and the post-comedy career could well be just in horticulture because yeah. that's what I 
That's what I know. Well, that, I think gardening, I, I'm not the first the person to come up with this, but gardening is a very good way of going, well, you need to do the work to reap the rewards. Yes, mate. I, um, I've got this theory that, I've got this theory that your, uh, your garden is the best life coach. Yep. Because it really teaches you, you can't, you can't force it. You got to put the work in and listen to how it answers you. Yeah. You got to be really patient and you've also got to be mindful of the seasons. It's like, it's like trying to force a spring plant on an autumn garden bed. Is not going to work anyway? Yeah. Whatever. Blah, blah, blah. Um, my parents had a beautiful garden centre and they really they really excelled as well. Like they won Best Garden Centre in Australia a bunch of times. Yep. And we grew up in the same block, like the house was on the same block. So it was this beautiful idyllic childhood where they were always, they, they had a fish pond and there's always been chooks and there's always been like plants and flowers around and yeah. a very wholesome mum and dad are always like even when they're at work they're still accessible you know you can go down and have a chat to them while they're watering yeah like it was a it was a pretty nice way to grow up and they didn't get pulled out by bunnings or no yeah, no they held fast they've sold to my brother and they still live in the house and so they see my brother all the time and often he'll drop his kids you know he'll come yeah. into work drop the kids up at the house and yeah, it's really lovely to go back. And when I go back and visit, I'm visiting my childhood home. Yeah. Yeah. Do you stay in the same room? I haven't moved into like an office or something like that? I moved around the house. I had a number of different rooms. But, yeah, yeah I do. St I stay in my teenage bedroom. My, see, my, at my dad's house, which is the house I grew up in, he's moved his bed into my room. Oh, the cheek of it's, it. And it feels weird. Yeah. It's like dad's in my room. This is weird. Like, yeah. But I've still got this. There's still stuff of mine in the cupboards. He just goes into the other room which he used to get Jesus. his clothes <laughs> it's bizarre isn't it fat? how like yeah. he's so set in his ways like there's a, this cupboard that's kind of you gotta you gotta close the door to open the cupboard it's this weird kind of where he keeps the ironing board what and then what a pain well this is the thing and then my sister-in-law was down there and said john do you mind if i just put the ironing board down here in this room and then i can just iron because there's space he goes oh that's a great idea why didn't i think of that i'm like You've been in the house for 35 years, Dad. Why didn't you think of that? Like, <laughs> but just, just set in his ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do, are you close with your family? I think you are. I'm really close with them, but um, I mean, man, it was so we just spent five and a half weeks living with them. Yeah. So Wade, my husband and my two kids, we're getting stuff fixed at our house. Yeah. And so we're looking for any excuse for another place to live. So we were like, why don't we spend the whole summer in Perth and we did and it went pretty well considering and I think Wade I mean honestly would you want to live no. with your in-laws for five and a half like no matter how much you love them right. it's just hard work I think my in-laws are in Perth as well and so it is a long way to go there so when you're there you go we want to you want to do the a most of it. stretch yeah whereas my parents live in Tassie so it's like you can go down there and just you spend three down. days and go oh yeah. yeah that's fine that's enough but Perth is like a, it's a 10 day minimum kind of trek mm. and well, we yeah. did five and a half weeks. Okay. And it was, I def, there were, I'd forgotten my family culture. Okay. And which is? And I brought, so my Melbourne family culture, so like Wade and the girls and I, there is a lot of hugging each other and telling each other we love each yep. other. There's a lot of talking about our mental health. There's, you know, like we just have a different family culture and I think I'd forgotten. And um, we f we missed a flight flying over, so we're getting there right before Christmas. There was a glitch in the booking. I know that sounds weird. I don't understand how it happened either. So we kind of, the check-in didn't work. We had to wait two more hours fly. So we'd had this really big morning. Yep. And we land and I'm sitting at the kitchen table with my dad and my brother and I don't know where everyone else is. But my dad just making conversation is like, oh, what a hard morning for you. That's pretty, I guess that's pretty emotionally sensitive. Anyway, and I started to say, I guess I just forgot. And I started to say, I wasn't even going anywhere with it. I went, yeah, you know, I just, I don't mind. I mean, I, I lost a friend this year. My dad just went, what, only one? 
And then he went on, started talking about this theory about how really if we could lose every second person, then the world would be in much better shape. <laughs> and I, it was a real slap in the face. Yeah. But I guess I'm in, I'm at your kitchen table. I'll just assimilate to your culture. But I had forgotten and I felt so stupid for trying to start a conversation about. Yeah. I something, think when you something go, that was still pretty painful. When you go back home, do your parents treat you like you were when you were living there 20 years ago? Yeah, a little yeah. bit. I think I, maybe I'll do the same when my kids come back home, but it is that thing of going, I don't understand why my parents still think I'm 17 years old. Like, Oh, but I think, I think in those walls, when I'm in those walls, I do. Like I've even got a joke about it that you uh, kind of revert back to how you the age you were when you left. Yeah. But you might be right. It might be a lot of signals coming from yeah. them. I, I have a I have a closer relationship to my mum. I yep. feel like she's a little bit more emotionally open. By the way, I just I I don't blame my dad or anything. It's just that it's the culture shock. It's yep. you forget that two different families can have such a and yet it's a family I know so well. Yeah. And my mum my mum is better, but even her, I was like, oh, it turns I didn't talk to either of my parents about having lost a friend in yeah. the end, five and a half weeks, and I was just like, we're just going to talk about the rainfall yep. and the wildlife and feeding the chooks. Yep. Yeah, my parents, uh, my dad especially, just weather. How's it here? Well, I'll tell you what it is here. I'm like, yeah. cool, that fills up two minutes of our conversation. He'll call me five minutes a week. Um, so what role do you play in the family as the older sister? Did you have a like... Did you look after your younger brothers or were they kind of on their own? I don't, I don't think I did look after them, but I don't think they needed looking after. I had a little tiny bit of a, so there's three years between each of us. So I didn't go through high school with the younger one. Yeah. But I definitely had a little sense of looking out for um, my brother Ian. He was and still is genius IQ. Yeah. But it was a small independent school. And I didn't really have a sense that he was in any danger of being bashed for being a nerd. Yeah. Like it was a pretty warm, friendly school. I feel like, um, uh, yeah, I, w- I wonder if there was more going on than I realised, but I definitely had a little affectionate big sister eye on him, but he seemed to be doing just fine. He found his people. Yeah. Um, I, I, I am the clown of the family. Yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't like publicly a clown until I was... In my 20s, I don't think, but at the at the dinner table, I think I was, I mean, everyone in my, in my family made jokes and was a little bit silly, but yeah. I didn't, I never acted like the big sister so much as I acted like the, the fool. Yeah. Were you, were, as a family, were you funny? Was it like humour kind of really kind of acknowledged and respected? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I don't think we were, I don't think we were like knee slappingly funny, but my dad's silly. Yep. And loves getting you to laugh. And I remember, I wish I remembered the joke, but I remember being like seven or eight and inventing it like just an off-the-cuff joke and he laughed at it. Yeah. And that was that was a defining moment of my childhood. I was like, those, this is good. Those core memories. I had the same one. Coming yeah. back from a football game, I said a joke in the back seat, made my dad and his friend both laugh and I was like, this is. Done. This Lock is, me this in. Is it. Yeah, this is a real core memory. All right, so when you had your own kids... Did you learn anything about your parents when you had your own kids? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I learnt, I mean, I learnt cliches, the relentlessness of it. So I just, I just learnt how all-consuming it was for them and I just assumed that their job was to look after me and, and so I guess I just all of a sudden had this insight into the fact that they were people without children once and that they had to do that same thing of like abruptly changing gears. Yeah. And be, and just hovering around us so that we didn't fall off the change table, walk into a fish pond, yep. starve to death. Like, you know, yep. basic care. So I know that's that's a cliche, but it is it's really mind opening, isn't it? When you're like, Oh, my parents yep. were people and then they were parents. They were people, their yeah. parents. This happened to them and, um, and yeah, you do, you do feel extremely grateful all of a sudden. Well, it's that thing you realise that no one knows what they're doing. 
Like, and there's that. Yeah, and also... I still haven't kind of... I still suspect that my mum knew what she was doing more than I did. But you also, the other thing I realised was that they're just trying their best and trying to do better than what their parents did. Yeah. And so when you think what are all the stuff that you're going through, well, the, your parents when they were that age went through it worse with parents who were probably less open to talking about feelings or... Less, oh, one hundred percent. My my parents both had really. No, my my father lost his dad really young, yep. so was brought up by a single mother on a farm in regional Western Australia. Like that was a rough child, not rough, beautiful childhood, with hardship. Yep. And my mum had an even rougher run. Like she, um, her father went left and went away, worked in the army, served in the army. They pretty much never saw him. Her mother died in a fire. Yeah. When she was like three and she got, she really just got passed around yeah. and they were in poverty. Yeah. That's, so, yeah, there's, there's no comparison. Yeah. There's my, my family, so my my nan, she was one of ten kids, I think, ten kids, and her father, when he found out that the next one was going to be born, was like, I can't look after this. They're better off getting the insurance claim from my life. And so he offed himself. And then all those kids, because the mum... They didn't. They didn't have like I mental wanna, health and depression. I'm so sorry. This is the wrong thing to focus on. But once upon a time, if you off, like, sorry, nowadays, if you off yourself, you don't get the insurance. No. Money, but back in the day. Well, I think the mother also was like, I can't handle all these kids on my own. So they all got separated and sent off to different families. Oh God! Right. And yeah. Okay. And then she. Then after like two years, then I was like, oh, okay, I've grieved, and now, and so it is that thing of like that was what my nan was dealing with as a small kid. And then she had her own kids and she had one with a guy who then he didn't stick around and then my dad, anyway, all this trauma, none of it was being, like, talked about. It all comes out, like, big family events, all this kind of stuff. <laughs> People have had drinks and it's like this is not the time to deal with this. And then I look at my parents and go, oh, well, they, well, they, well done. they turned out okay for what they had to go through. Yeah. Yeah. But... That's not what we're talking about. Okay. Um, all right. You all get together, all the family. What happens? What's the, what's the big get-togethers like? So your brothers have kids? One of them. Yep. One of them has kids similar ages to my kids, which is super good, and the yep. kids love it. Okay. But that is in Perth, so it's not all the time. Yep. The, the other one I want to ask, and I, yeah. I, cause this will be good because you have kids. I'm going to spin well. these together, am I? Yeah. No, no. So... At Christmas growing up, were the big gifts from mum and dad or the big gifts from Santa Claus? That's a great question. Thank you. I can't even remember. What about in your own family then with your kids? The big gifts are from us because I like to take my praise. <laughs> you know I do. See. I, I'm a really nice person but I still like, I like getting yeah. the love. But how old are your kids? They're seven, about at time of... Publishing of this podcast, eight yep. and ten. Okay. That's, yeah, are we, do they know? Have, have they had the conversation, we don't believe, or they? We haven't had the conversation. I think because I am not a big, I don't know how much, I don't know if there's kids in the car, so we're just talking around okay. this. We're talking around this. Yeah. Um, I'm not a massive fan of the myth. I'm like, life is full of enough magic without me paying good money to support the narrative of a white man. You know what I mean? I'm like, how come? Like, this is not even a good story. It's a silly story. And yep. do I, how can I respect my child if my child believes everyone in the world can be done in one night? So, no, I get I get it and I'm not going to stand in the way of everyone else loving it. Wade loved it. But I... me, I don't remember ever believing because I was always like, there are some logic problems here. This is clearly a pretend. And yep. so we just pretended. I never had the conversation with my parents. It, yeah, I just when, pretend it. When you break it down, it is really much like be good because they're watching, and then you'll get rewarded. Everything about it. It's just Christianity, but like commercialized. Yeah. So, but I do. I, I'm, as I said, I get. I get that everyone has their fun things, but I. I like. You know, I like. I like the fun things like Halloween, where you like. We're oh. not. We're not pretending we really are a witch. Yeah. We're just all dressing up and having a special. Like nothing wrong with a special occasion. James McCann wrote a great piece about Halloween and it's, it crystallised so much why it's such a fun holiday because it's for the children and it's also about community. So yeah. it's, it's, it's a holiday for the suburbs, okay, and it's that thing of like t- 
in today's world, we don't know our neighbours. Growing up, did you know your neighbours? Uh, barely. Okay. But I live. Our street was big. Like, I lived. I lived across the road from National Park. Like oh, we were okay. a long yeah. way from our neighbours. Yeah. So yes. So our, our, I grew up in the, in the burbs, and we. So you knew. We would go around house to house collecting kids on bikes, and would just go and oh. spend the day, and then come back when it was night time and dinner. And well, that's every, but so we knew it, but now. Well, my, well, actually my kids are getting the thing that I didn't get because we now live in Brunswick yep. in a part of Melbourne where the houses are close enough together Yeah. where we, where kids from the school are walking distance from us. Yeah. And for me, I'm like, this is what I never got. Yeah. This is like in a movie. And so Halloween, you go around and you meet all the neighbours that you kind of know person, like not, but you, you know them from seeing it at, at like we walk around the shops or all that kind of stuff. And then you go, oh, and then you have, it's a great holiday. And for everyone who's against it, because, oh, bloody Americanization of culture, it's like, it's actually really nice. You dress up, no one's scared of the costumes. You get lollies. The kids have a good time. The, the adults walk around behind going, oh, isn't that cute? This is fun. Well, I'm chatting to people. It's great. More of it. Yeah. Look, if I think, I don't love everything that comes out of America, but I think the top three things are Halloween, Hollywood, and pop music. Yeah. Everything else we don't need. What? A- NBA basketball is pretty good. Um, right. Okay, we'll put it there. That can be four. <laughs> uh, do you, do you, how often do you speak to your parents? Um, yeah, it should be heaps more. Yep. The end. I don't speak to them enough. I do a fair bit of texting. Yep. And it'll be like, a da- there's a family WhatsApp and sometimes I'll just heart the photos and sometimes I'll get involved. Yeah. And um and yes, every now and then I'll talk I'll talk to mum on the phone and it's lovely and it feel and at the end of it it's like I'll oh, I'll do that more often. Um yeah. fast forward four weeks and I'm like, oh still haven't called mum. And um I'd never asked this before, but what what's your what's the ideal situation for your own kids? What's what's what do you want them to be? in terms of people or career or anything like that. Do you think like this or is that too far ahead? Passionate. Yeah, that's good. Good answer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm, we're, all, we're all struggling with the meaning of life, although some of us are really good at just putting that off till tomorrow. You know, like, let's not. It's, it's a bummer to think about, right? Yeah. But the more I think about it, the more I think, like, just... If you're a bit excited to do the thing you've planned for today, then that's the best thing to do today. Yeah. It's, it's funny because everyone's been talking about Taylor Swift for the last two weeks in this country, even longer. And some people are really angry of the fandom of Taylor Swift. I don't know if you've seen this. Some people are complaining about, oh, this is ridiculous. Every single day we've got a Taylor Swift. Oh, why is everyone being so uncool? But it is that thing of like... Sometimes fandom can cross over into like, all right, this is, you got to pull it back a bit. But it is fun to be passionate about something other than yourself. Yes. And go, oh, this is, like, this brings me joy. And it's just pure joy. And I'm around other people who this brings joy to. And yeah. yeah. I'm, not, I'm not a fan of Taylor Swift in terms of her music. Like, give or take. It's not for me anyway. No, there's but a I couple do, of songs I might listen to. But I do like the fact that there's an artist in the world who people are losing their mind for. I love it. Yeah. I love, I, yeah. I, I love passion. I want more of it. All right. Moving on. Health or friends? That's what we've got left. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about health. Health. Okay. Would you say you're healthy? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I'll give myself three and a half stars. What prevents you from being healthier then? Um, at the moment, um, because we've been living semi-nomadically, but, you know, like with all the privilege of enough money to pay for places to stay. I'm not like boohoo, but I definitely haven't been um, haven't been eating consistently well and I haven't been exercising consistently either. Like I used to have a regular, um, a regular fitness class that I would do once a week that was just down the road from my home yep. and the rest of the time I would jog. Yep. And it was really good for me and now I'm just... You know, like I can feel it in my back and my hips and I can feel it in like when I have to run for a train. I'm like, oh, I'm not quite there anymore. And I really miss it because it is such a, you know what, it makes um, it makes career better and it makes family better yeah. when your health is there. I am, um, 
Here's what's on the good side of the ledger. Um, I don't drink and I think that helps me stay healthy. Yep. So I don't, don't drink or smoke and I think it's not because I'm a good person but it's because I'm a not fun person. <laughs> but <laughs> there you go. But I get the health benefits from it. I, um, I guess mental health, I've gone, I've come through a couple of years of being pretty pummeled, but still maintaining, like still having a perfectly good time with my career, you know, like keeping it, keeping it sufficiently backstage. And I think I, yeah, I, I think in the last 12 months I've done, God, it's expensive. How much Being is it fit. to go? No, I'm talking mentally. Oh. I'm talking about mental health. When you are trying to fix a problem yeah. and you're just like, oh, I hope three sessions will do it. No, it takes ages and you have to keep going back. And anyway, I think, I think I've managed to, I just don't, I guess one of the secrets to mental health is get comfortable with not feeling perfect. Yeah. Right, that's one of the lessons. Yeah. But still, you know, like there was, yeah, there were a few years there where it was um, just awful. So, at what age did you notice that you had to focus on your mental health? Um, I don't think I ever knew. Like, I got, I, I got diagnosed in my 20s with I guess the diagnosis would have been epilepsy question mark and it was what I was reporting and when I think back I'm like oh I was having panic attacks I was having debilitating panic attacks and didn't know what to call them (laughs) right so but I didn't know at the time yep and um and then in my early to mid 30s I had um I had an experience with health anxiety that was I mean, it's a weird thing and it's the frog in hot water thing. Like I don't know really when it started. Yeah. But at the point where I finally realised it was something that I should seek help about, it was, sorry, seek help with, I would wake up certain that I was dying and go to sleep certain that I was dying and if I wasn't busy then I was certain that I was dying. And it was just a belief that there was something in, because there's something invisible inside me that was killing me. Yeah. And it was... I mean, awful, but you just, you're still turning up to dinner parties and turning up to work and you're turning up to everything. Yeah. And you're doing a, you just look like a regular person. Was you? you I'm I'm very good at keeping secret feelings. And these panic attacks, have they subsided now or do you have more? No, I don't think I've really had panic attacks since. Now I, yeah, now I just, when it's bad, it's, um, yeah, it's it's a it's less a moment of an attack, and it's more like just a static under every yeah. day. Yeah, and but the, but I I don't I know, I know that it's not the very fact that I can turn up for my family and for my job. Yeah, is I think proof that it's not like what other people have lived through, yeah. and yet it's awful to live with. So, anxiety, such a yes. Oh, what a bore! No, oh, not it's at all. so boring. Everybody's got anxiety. It's so common and boring. So the people around you, do they notice when you <sighs> say uh, right. only Wade? Yeah, because I definitely again, I just it's um yeah Wade. I've gotten I the thing is I don't want to bore him with it. It's awful feeling like you're yeah. F- like you're faulty every day and you're like, oh, am I going to, am I going to tell him how I feel and have it be the same thing I've told him for the last three weeks? And like, how long, am, how long can he put up with that? But it's also the person who loves you most of anyone in the world. Who... And the minute you say yeah. it eases it a bit. Yeah. So I've realized that I've definitely, my instinct to be secretive is part of how it gets such a bad hold on me. And then if you flipped it, if it was Wade waking up every day with anxiety and was telling you, you I'd wouldn't... tell him to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> well, do something about it then. Go back to the psych. What are you just... Yeah, anyway. Yeah. No, yeah, I would absolutely want him to tell me. Yeah. Okay, so um, physical health growing up, was it something that your family talked about? Did you ever talk no, about... No, I'm so lucky though. I've got this family who were just... Um, they are... 
uh, they, their habits are healthy. Yep. Yep. Um, and I guess... They, yeah, they eat really well. They vegetable garden and yeah. they eat fresh from the garden. And my dad cycles. He is 80 next year and he'll cycle 40 kilometres in a day. You know, like he's just... The family are so healthy and I'm probably the least healthy member of my family. Yep. So my brothers, my two brothers and my mum and dad, healthier than me. Yep. When did you stop drinking? I just don't think I ever really started. Okay. And I've not... It's not that I've been... Um, I haven't been like straight edge my whole yeah. life or anything and I've not not drank but I haven't it's never really spoken to me as a I just I just don't like I I, I don't like it. And you never smoked? No, I never smoked. I've never smoked either. Was there ever like friends a group of friends all start smoking and just didn't invite you to the party? Do you know, I think that's one of the one of the benefits of being the clown. Like if you if you are com- if you like I guess I knew that I would never completely fit in anyway. Yeah. So I was happy to be the slightly unusual friend. So I do no, I didn't. I feel like I I never really maybe a little tiny bit at university there was the like longing to fit in. Yeah. But no, I didn't mix with the sort of people who'd be like, "You've got to do it." Well, it's 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 because smokers they do have that little they bond easier because easier because they go off. And have to have their cigarettes. Yes, if you're at work, I'm going to take a smoke, smoke-o. Yeah, it must be great. So they go off and they get to talk for five minutes. And I was talking, it's, it's almost like a, a little meditation. Like you stop what you're doing, just go and do something else for five minutes. Totally. Then I come love back it. to it. I make cups of tea though. There you and go. And you can have a chat. At, you can have a chat over the kettle. Yeah, the water cooler chat. Yeah. Uh, so do you have, in terms of your own mental health, do you have any red flags? You think, all right, I've got to... This is happening. I've got to do something about it. I've got to step back. I've got to pause. Mm. I can give you an example for me. I know. Tell me yours. When our bedspread doesn't have, when the doona cover doesn't have a cover on it, both Beck and I need to step back and go, okay, something's <laughs> not right here. <laughs> oh, no. For the first time ever in my life, my doona cover doesn't have a cover on it. But we have been in motion and I had to wash it. So what I did was I got this really nice flannelette sheet with flowers on it and I did that hotel tuck where you tuck a sheet around it. So it's still yeah. technically got a cover on it. Yeah. But it is funny you should mention that because for the first time I'm like, oh, this is exciting. And this that, is the first time I've ever not had a cover on it. And for the listener, that might sound so basic, but it is one thing I'm like going, so, like we're just too lazy to do it, which means that we're either working too hard or we're – a bit down. Yeah, no, that's... And it is, I think, okay, we need to... Oh, that's a really good one. We need to fix this. Um, I don't... I... I don't know. Uh, I mean... I mean, this is dull but snapping at the family. Yep. So snapping at unimportant things is... But that's obvious. Yep. And... Crying. Ah, oh, see, I'm. I mean, Laddle. That's I'm, a. That's probably. I mean, I should have a red flag before that red flag. Like, it'd be great if you could. If you had a yeah, smaller red flag yeah. that was not a cry. A yellow card first. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. You snap there, and then tears are coming. So, because I'm not a crier, I like. I just don't. I always thought of myself cry. as not a crier. Yeah. Josh L. Do you feel better after what afterwards though? Yeah. So here's what's happening when I cry. I am I'm announcing that I need help. Yep. And if I keep refusing to tell Wade that I'm feeling bad and then suddenly I'm like in a little ball crying, it's because I wouldn't use my words and so something else had to happen. Yep. I'm really painting a bit. I'm, I'm painting a terrible picture of myself. I'm very fine. I'm yes. fine, everyone. I'm fine, maybe going through a bit of a bad patch. I'm asking questions, you're answering honestly. It's great. Don't don't apologize. This is why I was nervous. <laughs> you're doing great. Um, our final question on health. Did your family has a have a soda stream growing up? Um not for the reason you think. It's because they were healthy hippies. They are. You don't have a soda stream when you're a hippie. Okay. What, what there did was you think my, I thought? my grandmother had a kombucha. She had, this is in the early 80s, mate. 
before it was cool, before, before Coca-Cola cool. were making kombucha. That's where we were at. We were not a soda stream family. Having we were a, oh, I can't floating, it. what's it called? The sco- SCOBY. SCOBY, that's right. Yeah. We weren't a soda stream, we were a SCOBY. Yeah. I heard you talk with Bron about the soda stream. Okay. I know that it's code for were you rich or were you poor. Well, not really. It's oh. also. What's, it, what's I, it code for? Well, I've heard people talk in the past saying their health, Went down when they were a kid with Soda Stream because they would just oh. make like five like fizzy yeah, drinks no, a day. Absolutely not. We were not allowed artificial colours or flavours. We yep. were like, we mum even had carob in the house. Ah, we were so like if we wanted a sweet treat, it was a dried apricot. We were very. But do your kids have banjo bears? The carob banjo bears? No, because they're disgusting. <laughs> My mother. No, sorry, banjo bears. They're a really good alternative. My mother-in-law buys the kids banjo bears. Do they every, eat them? Well, yes, but they're like. Does she know we like my kids? They have Slurpees most weeks. It's really bad, but that <laughs> that went like we play weekend sport. They've just run around for like forty minutes. Afterwards, we go and we get there's a, a, a bakery near us called Hot Volcano. It's next to a Seven Eleven. They'll get like a burger or a battered hot dog and then go and have a Slurpee. And it's a thing that when I was a kid, we would go to the basketball and Mum would give us four dollars and that could buy us a, what was called a Savaloy, but a hot dog and a bag of chips and a drink and it was like this is the best and it's and I look there's the whole thing of like there are no bad foods okay food is food well a slurpee is not food though it's to be fair it's ice and coloring okay yeah. okay so yeah but as long as you don't shame no, them for eating badly yeah. and go well they're well, doing that's the exercise the, man that's yeah. the I was so lucky to grow up in a family who just displayed healthy behaviors without talking about health like yep. it's so much better and we yeah Wayne and I really struggle around or like we don't want our kids to grow up like I would love for them to have the same attitude to health as me which is I just know what it looks like to behave like that rather yep. than have a cuz I do see friends who've had messages about healthy versus unhealthy, too much versus too little, you know, who've actually had those messages drilled into them. And yep. I see those friends, ha- but it's more, they spend more mental energy on choosing foods yeah. than I do. And it looks tiring Yeah. to to think about it too much. You're nodding. <laughs> I, I, I agree. It is tiring to think about the food all the time, but that's where I'm at in my life. Yeah. All right, friends, our final one. Final, how are you doing? You doing all right? I'm doing all right. Now, did you leave this one last because it's the one you wanted to talk about or one that you didn't want to talk about? Yeah, I didn't want to talk about it. Okay. No, uh, no, that's all right. All right. No, I don't want to, yeah. Are you still friends with people from your youth? Um, uh, I'm not. Um, I'm not but not intentionally not. Yeah. So there is um, my best friend from high school. I will occasionally see yep but this is really occasionally you know this is maybe once every five years and i and it's really nice yeah and um i really i think she's excellent did you have um but she's in purse did you have a tight group of friends in high school and stuff yeah it was a pretty tight i would say i would say i had a clear best friend yeah but i really liked a lot of people yeah and we had a it was a pretty unusual high school because um my primary school had existed for 100 years and when I was in year seven, they started year eight to 12. Yeah. So they started a new campus of the same school, year eight to 12. So by the time I went, there was only ever a year above me. Ah. It was small and in my graduating year, there were 23 kids. Yeah. And I don't know how much that's the reason, but I – so I – I've – find the idea of my daughter's looking at high schools at the moment and you look at like a thousand kids go. I I find it so daunting because I went to a tiny school and I'm used to dealing with 20 personalities at once. My eldest Ollie just uh, started high school this year and there's more year sevens than there were in his entire school last year. Yeah. And so he's, because we're, you know, asking him how's high school going? Did you miss anything from primary school? He goes, yeah, I miss the smallness. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I I get that. Like, yeah, you were. I get it. Yeah. Um, Because you were quite studious at school. You really knuckled down and. Yeah, I think um, I could have done a heap better. Oh, really? Mm, Yeah, I was really disappointed with my 
you know, my final yep. mark. But it actually was, it was fine. I mean, it was good enough to get me into the, like occupational therapy and yep. physiotherapy. I can't remember it was good enough to get me into law. I can't because I didn't want to do that. I can't remember exactly. And of course, it was, it was you know, like 30 years ago and on the Perth, right? I'm, yeah. I'd, whatever the number would be, it wouldn't mean anything now anyway. No. But I did well, but I had a real sense that I could have done better. Like I remember winning um, Westpac in, Westpac had a high school maths competition and it wasn't a, you didn't study for it, you just went in. Yep. And I remember getting in the top 0.3% of the state. And um, that's good, That's right? very good, yes. And my... I mean, you should know, you're the maths expert, so... Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's good, right? So I was, I had, but that's, but if something required the actual work, so if it was turning in an assignment, it was never as good as it should have been. But if it was the sort of work that you do without prep, I was very good at it. Yeah. So, I, yeah. I uh, feel the same. And I think a lot of comics might do this. I, I was always a leave it to the last night, which is the opposite of what I'm like now. But at school it was, I'll leave it and I'll do it on the last night and I'll just cram and I'll get away with it. And because I could speak in front of people, I could do my assignments, any public speaking thing, I'd be like, yeah, I'm fine. I, I'm, yeah. I'll just get up there and I'll wing it if I need to and yeah. put on the charm and try and be funny and that'll that'll get me through. And then I did something switched in like uni where I was like, it wasn't until like second or third year uni where I realised, oh, if I actually put in the work if and apply, I apply. myself... I'll do well in these yeah. things. But I only had third year theatre where I did really well and then first year teaching did really well and then I realised I didn't want to – I also had a massive breakup in halfway through the teaching. Congratulations. Yeah, second year and it was like I'm just depressed. I'm just going to do my entire, all my coursework in the space of like two months and then I'm going to get the fuck out of Tassie. <laughs> and that's why I didn't do great but also I was like I don't want to teach. Yeah. Just, yeah. Um, um, yeah, I discovered work later as well. Yeah. I didn't want to work. I wanted to do lots and lots of different things and I was, every minute was full, but I didn't discover sort of properly applying myself until later. And now I love work. Like I, I love the idea of working really hard for 12 hours straight. Yeah. All right. How do you make friends? Friends. How do you make days. friends? How do you make friends? Oh man, you just know, don't you? It's so exhilarating when you are like in a new work environment or something and yeah. someone will say something and you're just like, I like the flick they did with their finger and the intonation of that sentence and the fact that they thought of that sentence and then you watch them for the rest of the day and you're like, I'll invent an excuse. Yep. I'll get their number. We'll just uh, And so for me, I'm not on social media. Yep. Like I'm on there but I keep my distance so I can't. I think I think that's a really good way. A lot of people in our industry, especially, yeah. will just connect by starting their conversation online. It's so much easier as well. Oh yeah, so much less confronting than actually being face to face with a person and just showing interest. <laughs> I have definitely though. Yeah, I love I love the face to face, and for somebody riddled with anxiety, I find. Social stuff, like I, I guess partly, it's partly exhilarating because it does feel like risk, but yeah. it is a thrill to say we should be friends. Like I just never underestimate the power of saying out loud we should be friends. Yeah, and then they might go, <laughs> and then you're like, all right, well, I guess it's not going to happen. Or they're like, yes, we should, and then it's on. And I, yeah, I, it's so fun to meet a new person that you feel like you should have known 10 years ago. It, it, see, I'm, and Bron, Bron, Bron brought this up and I've been thinking about it ever since, which is like, I'm, I'm very cynical. Like, yeah. And I don't, I don't take people on face value, which is, I'm always like, oh, do they really mean that though? Are they just being yeah. nice? Okay. And so most of my friends I, I've made in my adult life has been from someone calling for a volunteer and then looking around who didn't volunteer and going, these are my people. <laughs> and it's, bad it's not a healthy way to live it's the people who are like so what snarky you're saying you like people for what they don't do rather than what they do uh, do i got through a bad habit of liking snark and it was comes from being a music snob just going oh you like that yeah. i don't like that and that's how i define myself of the things i don't like yeah 
And so that's how I made friends. They don't like that either. We like cool stuff, which we don't know what it is, but we know we don't like that. And that is not healthy in your 40s. It could be fine in your 20s, but in your 40s, you're like looking around going, this is kind of sad and depressing and people kind of like just hate everything for no reason. And that's when contrarians come. And that's when I noticed it in musicians, punk musicians all were about fuck, fuck the government and then they're just contrarians and then they're like about fuck just they, they turn right wing and it's like, oh, no, oh, no. this is no good. Oh, no. No good. Yeah, I love, I do love people. Yeah. And, um, and I, yeah, I feel like there are a lot of people I really like and it is hard to fit all the people I like in. Well, that was a good question. Do you set aside time for friends to actually go, all right, I'm going to catch up with this friend and when I've got this opportunity or? Yeah, yeah. I feel like a lot of my friendships are sustained by months of like placeholder dates that get postponed. Yep. And so, and then you always see that person and you've only got an hour because they're on their way somewhere and you're on your way somewhere yep. and you get through as much as you can and it's not everything. And then you're like, we've got to do this again sooner. And then it is months and months and months. Yep. And, um, yeah, I, I think it's a wonderful thing to have people that you vibe with and love so much that you can do that. Yeah. But um, but it feels like a real waste of one of the best things in life. Have you had any friend breakups? Yeah. Um. I mean, I remember being, I remember being about 19 and having my best friend from high school, the person that I still occasionally see, I had her write me a letter breaking up with me. Was that for an incident or just her wanting to move on or you don't have to go into the incident but like. There was no incident. Yeah. I was working on a. I was working in an, on an amdram on an amateur theatre show, like a pantomime. Yep. So I was, I was just probably not there for her. And she came to see the show and handed, you know, and handed me the letter. Yep. So it was a really weird thing performing to her, having just read the letter. Ah, oh, got to get the letter after. Mate, I know, oh. but this is not, whatever. And I can't remember the details of the letter, but the sense of being a sort of slightly shallow, unreliable person has lingered for me. Yeah. And I and I, I've definitely Yeah, I've definitely mm, Yeah, how how am I I th I think I've I think I still feel like and an unlikable person, so it's always a thrill when I win someone over. Yeah. Like Bron Lewis is an example of someone we met in the school playground and I so I guess we met five years ago now. Yep. And um and I instantly liked her and we get along really well. We've been on holiday together a couple of times and I still and I adore her and love spending time with her and I still am waiting for her to tire of me. She will not. She speaks very highly of you all the time. Well, yeah, but that's just until she gets her foot in the door better with television, which is <laughs> imminent, she won't need me anymore. She'll realise that I am annoying and shallow no. and silly no. and without substance. She will not. She's a good person and she won't think that and you know that. I don't know if I do, but most of me. <laughs> All right, back to this. There are two truths and one of me knows that and one of me doesn't yeah. and we'll never know that. All right, that is the end. You got through it. It was great. I did. Josh, it is the end. And, yeah, yeah, right. Well, it's not there really is, the end. There, It isn't the end and there is also this glaring absence of a missing friend and I, and it's very kind of you not to. Yes. Well, 
look, it's yeah, it's the elephant in the room for a, a lot of these interviews. It she has yeah been a, a presence in you know, so many of people when I talk about friends, and it's like, like and I knew that you were so close, and that's for you to talk about in your own time. But this is important because it's like. Because of what it does to your burners. Because mm. you're like... Because in order to do the right thing by your family and keep yourself healthy because that's the only way to keep working and to keep working because you promised your family you would and because even when you don't create... You know, when you don't believe in your career momentarily, you're like, I know I will next week and I have to not drop these balls. Yeah. Like I have to... The burner has to stay on because if I don't next week when I need it, I will be sorry. Yeah. Friends are the thing. It's the burner that gets turned off. It's the only one that can. And you have the benefit of... Like my family contains one of my best friends. Yeah. Like my husband's one of my best friends. And my career, I have this wonderful luxury of really loving the people that I work with a lot of the time. So I don't see my friends. But I tell you what, you lose one and you... Yeah. You like desperately looking around for another burner to turn off. It's the thing that's come up the most on the show as well, like especially people our age, we're just at a point where we're like friends... And it's not that we want to turn it off. Like we desperately want to be social and want to have those friends and have that support to fall back on when we need it. But when everything else is going on, you're like, well, something's going to go. And as Ben Brown pulled out the, the rubber ball glass ball. I love the rubber ball glass ball. Friends. They're rubber. If they're, if they're you, true friends, they'll bounce back for you. You just keep writing, actually something's come up. How yep. about in two weeks? Yep. Great. What a lovely episode, Claire. Thank you for doing this. Thanks for having me. Hey, you've got your show. Let's let's talk about this show that you've been working on for a year. Tone shift, quick. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been working on it for a year, but I have, yeah. Um, I've got a show called So Proud. So Proud. And it's on in Melbourne? Yeah, I'm doing I'm doing an Adelaide festival, sorry, an Adelaide fringe run, a Canberra night. Nice. And um I'm doing the whole of Melbourne International Comedy Festival. Excellent. And it's called So Proud. It's and so proud. And yeah, it's very silly, but it's also about I guess I guess it's about how we pretend to be proud of people when we love them enough to protect them from our true feelings. Is that what it is? I didn't know that's what it was about, but that's what came out of my mouth. I like it. I like it. Hey, thanks everyone for being Patreon subscribers. You're the absolute best. Um, go to patreon.com slash D-Y-K-W-I-A if you'd like to become a Patreon subscriber. Every week there's bonus episodes of Podfresh, my podcast about the So Fresh compilations. Also I'm doing four uh, Don't You Know Who I Am's in the Comedy Festival here in Melbourne, uh, Saturdays at 3 o'clock. Great names already signed on to do it. I'm very looking forward to doing these shows. Plus my show, my stand-up show, Four Burners, is on from April 8 to April 21 at Tasman Terrace, 8.35. Tickets are on sale at joshearl.com.au. The first Saturday is almost full. So if you want to get in that one, it's going to be full. Uh, that'd be great. Anyway, you're all the best. Claire, you're the best. I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.